Welcome. Uh, this is Dr. Jim Green, director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, and he's going to be talking about The Martian, science fiction and science fact. Welcome, Dr. Green. So how do we get it from there to there? Okay, great. Thank you very much. So uh, we're going to have a little fun this morning uh, because we're going to have um, uh, talk about uh, Mars in a fictional way, but it actually is, um, uh, has a number of aspects about, about the movie The Martian and the book that's very realistic. So several years ago, Andy Weir wrote a book called The Martian. He um, actually published it online, didn't go through any book publisher, and by word of mouth, it became incredibly popular. Consequently, um, uh, 20th Century Fox uh, contacted him, bought the movie rights, and uh, in a year and a half or so, uh, developed a movie called The Martian, with Matt Damon as the lead. So what I thought I'd do is show, uh, so how many have read the book The Martian? All right, this is going to be easy. <laughs> so uh, let me um, uh, give you a little a clip if you haven't seen it from the movie. This is actually the trailer. Every human being has a basic instinct to help each other out. If a hiker gets lost in the mountain, people coordinate a search. If an earthquake levels the city, people all over the world send emergency supplies. This instinct is found in every culture. Can't, I can't do it from here. Without exception. At around 4.30 a.m., our satellites detected a storm approaching the Ares 3 mission site on Mars. The storm had escalated to severe, and we had no choice but to abort the mission. But during the evacuation, astronaut Mark Watney was killed. I'm entering this log for the record. This is Mark Watney, and I'm still alive, obviously. I have no way to contact NASA or my crewmates. Uh, even if I could, it would take four years for another manned mission to reach me. And I'm in a hab designed to last 31 days. So, in the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. Okay, let's do the math. I gotta figure out how to grow four years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. But if I can't figure out a way to make contact with NASA, none of this matters anyway. Houston, be advised. They've got a video message. It's directed to the whole crew. Play it. My God. <laughs> Mark Watney's still alive. Woo! In your face, Neil Armstrong. <laughs> Let's go get our boy. This is something NASA rejected. So we're talking mutiny. And if we mess up the supply rendezvous, we die. If we mess up the Earth gravity assist, we die. It's space. It doesn't cooperate. I guarantee you that at some point, everything's going to go south on you. And you're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Is it possible that he's still alive? Okay, that's a movie I want to see, right? <laughs> now, what's really great about it is uh, many, many aspects about it I really enjoy. Uh, they, uh, Ridley Scott and his team contacted NASA. We put together a series of consultants to help him paint the picture that's as realistic as possible that they can use within the movie. So that included uh, aspects about the HABs, the screens, the 
you know, vehicles, uh, all the kinds of things that uh, were on our drawing boards are actually building at a variety of centers to support uh, humans on Mars. So this is a movie Vint Cerf is going to really love because it's all about communication in many ways. And it's very realistic from that aspect. Uh, a, a stranded astronaut on Mars uh, has to communicate back and indeed um, uh, uh, uses an infrastructure and capability and figures out how to do that. And the time delay and everything else is indeed all there. Now, there's some aspects of the movie that aren't realistic. Uh, indeed, um, uh, what caused the problem of stranding the astronaut is a huge dust storm. And indeed, there are dust storms um, on Mars. Uh, unfortunately, they're not as severe as portrayed in the movie. So here's a couple scenes out of the movie. You can see the dust storm coming. Now we have some dust storms that look from the ground much like what was seen in the movie. They look severe, uh, and, and, and in reality, um, the wind may blow 120 miles an hour, but it's not even enough to straighten out a U.S. flag sitting on the surface. Uh, in fact, most of the dust storms that we get uh, like from Opportunity, you see on the left a nice clear day and, and now it's getting foggy, it's a uh, uh, dust storm is coming in and uh, what happens is uh, the opacity actually reflects the sunlight and uh, back out into space and it just gets uh, more dark, more, more evening-like. Now there are hazards and dust storms on Mars. Uh, what we have seen uh, particularly those that will go up 20 and 30 kilometers. There's a lot of charge that's uh, resident on the dust. Uh, that charge can be separated and we can actually get discharges or lightning strikes. We've seen some examples of that in even some of the data you can see. Uh, during the dust storm, a lightning strike and then uh, the, even that gets covered up by the dust as it settles out of the atmosphere. Uh, things like dust devils, of course, really helped us keep opportunity and spirit alive because they swept the dust off the solar panels. So uh, that's been an important part of, uh, of those missions, uh, extended life. Here's an overview of uh, the missions that we currently have. Uh, Mars Odyssey, Mars Express, uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MAVEN, and Indian Space Research Organization just got into orbit last year, the Mars Orbiting Mission. What's coming up are other missions. But within this infrastructure, Vent Surf is completely correct. We use these orbiters as relays. Now, this didn't happen on Pathfinder, didn't have the orbital infrastructure, but indeed, both Opportunity and Curiosity communicate their data up to the orbiters. That's stored and then forward back to Earth, and we get a reasonably good bandwidth back. They do have capability to direct to Earth on both of those. Uh, but once again, uh, that's indeed very low rate. Upcoming missions like InSight will get back down on the ground. We launch that March the 4th. It lands in September, all of next year. So that will be an, our big next step. ESA has the Trace Gas Orbiter, and then we have two other uh, landers. ESA's working on their ExoMars, and we're working on our big one, which is the Science Rover in 2020. Uh, those are uh, really important uh, missions. Now, uh, in the book The Martian, by the time uh, the book is set in 2035, uh, Andy has uh, uh, 12 orbiters from NASA and two orbiters from ESA, more than enough for a great internet capability, delayed tolerant network from Mars back to Earth. And in fact, indeed, as Vint mentioned, uh, we're quite interested in optical communication. So we will have high-speed links back to Earth through upcoming orbiters uh, using optical communication that's absolutely essential to be able to bring back high-rate video, voice, and data in support of humans on Mars. And of course, from a scientific perspective, we're really quite excited about that because we can bring back a lot of data if, that, if we can get that going in the 2020s. Now, uh, here's our 2020. It has a, a, a fabulous payload. It'll go to a geographically diverse set of sites. It will look at uh, the mineralogy. It'll look at uh, important areas that it will then core rock uh, we want those cores back. It's really the record of Mars and how it's changed over time is, is in uh, the geology and in the rock record. We want that. 
but we also have some really exciting experiments that are first step in supporting human exploration on Mars. And we call uh, that uh, capability uh, the in situ resource utilization. And, and one example that we're using is called MOXIE. And MOXIE is a Mars oxygen ISRU experiment. It's uh, very compact. Uh, it um, brings in the CO2 in the atmosphere and through electrolysis pops off an oxygen and then stores that. Oxygen, of course, is very important for us to be able to support uh, humans on Mars breathing, but also rocket fuel. So there's an element of that that's quite important. This is our first step in, B8, in, in, in the ability to do that. So when we look back at Mars over all the rovers and landers that we have, here's where InSight is going to be landed. And as you can see, it's very close to where Curiosity is. Uh, now in the uh, movie, Ares 3, which is the uh, landed station for humans. This is the third one in the series out of the book. This location, as you can see, is at a, is at a different site, uh, well above Viking 1 and Pathfinder. Now, Pathfinder actually plays an important role in the movie. Now, when we look at Mars, and of course, one of the resources that's so important uh, is water. When we look at Mars today, here's a Hubble image of that, looks very arid and dry, but in its past, we now know Mars's climate was incredibly different, in a significant atmosphere that allowed liquid water, or allowed water to be, remain liquid on its surface. And consequently, we believe now that there's perhaps maybe half of the northern hemisphere was, uh, was, in, was in, uh, uh, in, under the ocean. And in fact, Ares III in this example uh, would be sitting uh, uh, at the bottom of an ancient ocean. Now we have from our high-rise space or high-rise instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter the ability to look in great detail, see easily see that table from the orbit of Mars if it was sitting on the surface. So when we train our instruments on the Ares 3 base, here's where it would be located. Uh, based on the book, and of course you have to imagine in the 2030s that's where the HABs and everything else will be. Well, as you see in the movie, of course, uh, Mark Watney gets stranded. Here he is at the Ares 3 site, and he has to go down uh, to Pathfinder to be able to establish communication back to Earth. Okay, And so that's uh, part of the premise of the book. Now this is a significant journey. It's a significant journey. It's more than 500 kilometers. And what we're currently planning for human exploration is what we call an exploration zone. This is about uh, an area of about a diameter of 100 kilometers. And within that location, we're going to land, we're going to live, we're going to go to various sites to do science and we're going to set up various sites for in situ resource utilization. So that would be oxygen production, that would be uh, solar panels getting power, that would be um, uh, maybe uh, Mars thermal energy uh, that could be used for heating halves, uh, but definitely places where we would uh, extract water out of the atmosphere because indeed it's, it, there is some humidity in the atmosphere that we can, that we can extract but in, in, in an important way, uh, out of the ground, perhaps even in aquifers. Now, that's 100 kilometers. That's a huge uh, region uh, to explore in. And for us to be able to determine where those sites are on Mars, right now we have a call to the science community to tell us where those sites would be on Mars. And so the first human site selection workshop where we're going to look at candidates is going to occur at the end of October uh, at, at uh, the Lunar and Planetary Institute, which is uh, just adjacent to uh, the Johnson uh, Space Center, JSC. Once again, uh, Mark Watney goes down to Pathfinder uh, to uh, be able to get his communication back to Earth started to let, him, to let everybody know he's there. And of course, when we do high resolution imaging, uh, Pathfinder is sitting uh, pretty much in a flat area, a large flat area, back shell and, and other heat shield uh, elements from, from landing a uh, Pathfinder is easily seen in, in our views. And so this is really quite the trek. 
just to go down and get the communication capability. Now he goes back, of course, to Ares III, and eventually he decides that he needs to consider going to uh, Ares IV, which is the next site that's where a material is being accumulated that they will set up the next visit for humans on Mars. This is a tremendous hike of well over 3,200 kilometers. And uh, uh, what we see in the bluish area, this of course is where the ancient ocean is, the greenish area is where the shoreline has been, uh, and indeed uh, Ares IV has uh, quite the height to it. So this is not only a long trek to go, but he also has to go in altitude of approximately uh, six or so kilometers. So the uh, movie is exciting, uh, based on the book largely. A lot of communication problems going on, involving the delay, involving how to rescue him, how that will occur. Uh, what, I, what I really like about it is, not only is it, it, is it, it, it that it's exciting, it's a little more realistic than anything else we've seen about humans on Mars. There's no laser flights. There's no uh, spacecraft flying at each other, uh, crashing. Uh, there's no robots running on the surface from DARPA trying to kill other astronauts. And there's certainly no aliens besides the Martian, who is Matt Damon uh, from Earth. So although it's not completely accurate, you know, for the scientists, check your science at the door, go on and enjoy the movie. But re recognize it's going to be something like that in various aspects. So thank you very much. I think we have, we have time for a couple questions. There we go. Yes, sir. Oh, we got another one. Okay. I'm not deciding who gets the question first, so. Oh, oh here he is. <laughs> Okay, yeah, another one um, is he, he needs power. And, and so uh, one aspect of it, uh, and heat, and one aspect of it is uh, he goes uh, away from the HAB to re, uh, uh, reclaim an, a buried uh, radioisotope thermal power system, an RTG. So a buried RTG down at several meters. We would never bury an RTG. Now, the, what's, what's in this area of blue, where Ares 3 is, actually just below the surface, we believe is a pretty nice ice layer. And if you buried an MMRTG, which is a multi-emission th radioisotope thermal generator that we have on Curiosity that we're going to be putting on 2020, and you buried it in the ground, you would melt that water, and there's plenty of microbes on the MMRTG. Planetary protection would kill us because we'd start a human colony of microbes right then and there. So that would be another thing we, didn't, we wouldn't do. But indeed, um, that's very minor, you know. Uh, that's not a problem. That's just, uh, just one of those technical details. Yes, sir. Oh, that's a good question. Um, Oh, the question is, uh, does the film make use of the fact that it's much less gravity, about 30% of the Earth's gravity? Um, not probably as much as it really should, but um, I don't let that bother me. Yeah, so um, I have uh, read several versions of the script. Uh, it really follows the book quite well. Um, uh, it can't do everything that's in the book. You know, uh, that's the unfortunate thing about that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's pretty true to the book. What Ridley really wanted to do, Ridley Scott wanted to do, was paint a realistic picture of everything around you, which ha you have to do in a movie. In a book, you can imagine that. You can imagine the scenes. You can imagine the conflicts and the control centers and, and the press conferences and all the stuff that goes on and what that might be like, but Ridley actually had to paint that. And that's why he went to NASA to get, to get that background visual information as close as he possibly could to make it a realistic movie. And that's what we liked about it, and um, uh, that's what I think you'll, you'll certainly enjoy. One more?
Yeah, well, so will the, uh, the, uh, will the movie encourage or discourage uh, interest in Mars? Well, I saw the trailer. I liked it. I wouldn't want to go to that. Uh, I think what it's going to do, because I believe the general population wants us to go to Mars. They're supporting us go, uh, to go to Mars through the funding that we get. They'll be even more excited about going to Mars because this is the vision of the future. It looks doable. Yeah, there's challenges. We know what those challenges are. We know enormous amount about Mars. We are up to those challenges. Let's do it. Last question. Okay, has NASA found any surface volcanism on Mars? Yeah, there's been past volcanism all over the place. There's no indications at the moment of active volcanism. Wouldn't you agree, Pam? Yes. Insight. Insight will help, indeed. Yes, sir. I guess we're going to squeak out another one. Yeah, so um, where would one go to get access to water? Here actually is a global water resource map. As you can see, uh, the red boundary has water actually, uh, water ice fairly close to the surface, we believe. These are our best estimates of what's going on. Uh, the groundwater recedes as you go down closer to the equator, perhaps five meters, and, and then of course down at the equator, it's uh, even further. This is really exciting news because our earlier models had it much deeper. But, but through uh, what Curiosity's been doing, uh, what we actually observe from MRO, where there's impacts and it kicks up the ice and we watch the ice sublimate away, uh, can really tell us a lot about uh, resources that we can get access to. So I think that's it. Thank you so very much.